reading from Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to apostles, teaching and fellowship to breaking of the bread and prayers. All come upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread and at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Well, I imagine that most of us, somewhere in the back of our minds, have a mental image of the model church. It might be the little country church in which you grew up, or perhaps one served by a pastor that you loved, or maybe an ideal vision of fellowship, peace, and love. Our reading today from Acts presents such a picture. It gives us a window through which to view the early church and a yardstick by which to measure ourselves. This passage comes at the end of Peter's sermon on Pentecost, the first proclamation of the newborn church. That must have been some sermon. And 3,000 people joined the community. We wouldn't know how to handle that today, would we? Even the megachurches don't get that kind of results. But lest we think it's all about the numbers, it doesn't end there. This passage describes a community that is living together, eating together, learning together, praying together, the kind of community that most church leaders would give anything to have. It has been called the model church. Writing in the lectionary commentary, Gabriel Fakra, who is a professor emeritus at Andover Newton Theological School in Massachusetts, looks at a series of four Greek words to describe the activities of the early Christians and to set forth a model for the modern church. The first, kerygma, proclaiming, refers to the telling of the Christian story and is a form of teaching. It is the same story that we tell today. And with spiritual hunger rampant and generations asking ultimate questions, it is a story that we must continue to tell, not to let cultural and other influences change it or water it down to be less offensive. And we must tell it with the same awe that came upon everyone in the early church. The second word is diakonia. Fakra calls it doing, is the word from which we get diaconate or deacon. The account in Acts said that they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. In his commentary on Acts, Ben Witherington explains that What is described here is that no one was claiming any exclusive right to whatever property they had. And when needs arose, the early Christians readily liquidated what assets they had to take care of one another's needs. Deaconing, Fakra says, is more than serving communion. And it is not limited to those who hold a certain office in the church. 
Now listen, it is the commission of the whole church to care for everyone. I'm going to say that again. It is the commission of the whole church to care for everyone. The third word is koinonia. Fakhri's word is being. A word found only here in Luke's writings and often translated as fellowship. But it is more than that. It is best understood as deep sharing. There was a spirit of oneness as they ate together, studied together, prayed together, and worshipped together. The ideal community was one in which the needs of the citizens were cared for by the common efforts of everyone. And finally, liturgia, celebrating, literally work or duty of the people. Of course, from which we get our word liturgy. They spent much time together in the temple and breaking bread. It was study, sharing, table fellowship, prayer and worship that kept the early church steady in times when things were happening that would threaten their very existence. For us, Worship is at the heart of our faith, and breaking bread is at the heart of our worship. They are what keep us grounded and focused on Christ's call to love one another. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes about Christian community. He tells the story of a unique fellowship in an underground seminary in Nazi Germany that reads much like one of Paul's letters. It gives practical advice on how life together in Christ can be sustained in families and groups and addresses the roles of prayer and common worship and everyday work as well as Christian service. Bonhoeffer writes that community is not something to be taken for granted. As a pastor, he saw the church functioning as a living and vibrant organism, what he called a community of love. But he also saw a gap between what the church should look like in the book of Acts and what it actually looked like in the eyes of the world. Now, I can't help but think of our early history. Dick Gardner's book, A Candle Set on a Stand, paints a rather inauspicious picture of our early years. He writes that the church, that is, First Christian Church, started by Joel Hayden back in 1834, thrived at least until a particular chain of events took place that would lead to its unraveling. Now, I've shared with you the story from the Springfield leader from back in 1887. Here is the account from the St. Louis Globe Democrat as to what happened that Sunday morning in January. For several weeks, a warm and at times acrimonious warfare has been waged in the Christian church in this city between those who opposed the musical instruments in public worship and those who favored the organ. Yesterday, affairs were brought to the crisis and there were some sensational scenes. After the pastor, E.G. Laughlin, had read the opening hymn, the organist began playing, and many joined in singing. But at the same time, the opponents of the organ started up another hymn tune, and pandemonium ensued. When the sacrament was announced, Brother Rogers arose and said he preferred not to partake with the organ people. After the sacrament, 
An anti-war brother arose to smooth matters over with a talk, but was interrupted with a lively hymn volunteered, volunteered by the organ crowd. At the close of the services, Mr. Bills, having consulted a lawyer, was advised to play the organ at all hazards, and he did so, and the meeting broke up in confusion. <laughs> well, much of what happened in the ensuing months and years, we do not know for sure, but we do know that the anti-organ branch agreed to purchase the property and the pro-organ faction finally split from First Christian and became South Street. Gardner commented that events such as these cannot be considered the finest moments in the life of any congregation. <laughs> the remarkable thing is, however, that after less than 15 years, and after such bitter differences, the two factions began to talk seriously about the possibility of reunification. Indeed, the, coup, the two congregations eventually did reunite. And here we sit today, having learned that life together is sometimes contentious and difficult, and still striving for an ideal such as Luke sets forth in this passage from Acts. As Luke looks back on the beginning of the church, a half century or so after it began, he is trying to show Theophilus the true character of the church at its best. But elsewhere in Acts, he does not offer stories, or he does offer stories that are not entirely positive perhaps giving us reason not to feel too bad about our early history. Fakra concluded that for the church to be what it was in its New Testament origins, its telling and celebrating will issue in doing and being. Let's be realistic, though. Luke is looking back through very idealized lenses. But historical, the, historically, the church has not always been one in the spirit. It has on occasion been guilty of exclusion, corruption and greed, as well as abuses of power and people. The church has wounded many, and unfortunately, it continues to do so. But as the body of Christ, we are called to be upright and faithful, to be a place of healing and welcome to all. This inspiring message from Acts gives us that model. Now, we do have one thing in common with the early church, people. And therein lies the problem, right? As long as there are people in churches, there will be differences of opinion, power plays, factions, and exclusion. Ah, but without people, there would be no churches. So we best use this text as Luke intended it, as a picture of the church on its best behavior as a broad sketch of the church at its very beginning, faithful in teaching, active in sharing, devoted to eating, praying, and worshiping together, and in awe of God. And yes, as a model toward which to strive. So let us continue to envision a church perhaps not unlike the one in Acts 2, built on the concepts of proclaiming, doing, being, and celebrating. It will not be easy to be that church, and it will take all of us working together 
in one spirit, just like the early church. With God on their side, a bunch of disillusioned, disoriented, disorganized apostles became the church. And so can we. Will you pray with me? Faithful God, as we strive to be your church in these times, let us learn from our past failures and whatever our future may bring, help us to remain faithful. Amen.